Hi, thanks for joining me today. We're going to have a really quick talk about tumor lysis bloods. We're going to look at why you do them, what to order, and how to interpret it. Pretty much in that order, actually. So let's go straight into our diagram. Tumor lysis occurs in certain high risk tumors when there's a massive cell turnover, or more commonly after chemotherapy. And it happens because those cells are burst open and the intracellular content to release into the serum in large amounts. So if we go from left to right from on the diagram, potassium is leaked out from the cells. Remember, it's an intracellular electrolyte that will cause a rise in serum potassium, leading to cardiac arrhythmias and potentially death. Phosphate is also released, leading to serum hyperphosphatemia. And this binds with calcium that's already in the serum. So this has two knock-on effects. First of all, the serum calcium will drop, leading to tetany seizures, that sort of thing. And the other thing is that this bound substance, the calcium phosphate, can deposit in the kidneys and cause renal failure. Thirdly, we have uric acid released. This is derived from purines found in DNA, so they break down, increasing the uric acid level in the blood. And this can deposit in the kidney again and cause a uric acid nephropathy. So as we can see, the two main problems are arrhythmias and kidney failure but low serum calcium can also sometimes be a problem. Who's most at risk then? So we have leukemia patients, especially those with high white counts, um, over 100. Certain lymphomas, Burkitt's, um, aggressive diffuse large B-cell lymphomas, um, CLL as well in certain situations. And the lymphomas um, in particular can induce tumor lysis syndrome after steroids as well as chemotherapy. So be careful with that. Uh, blastomas, um, neuroblastomas and so on and then really any cancer patient that's got certain risk factors so things that can compound the risks uh, renal impairment or medications so my example here is ACE inhibitors increase potassium so that risk of hyperkalemia can go up and so all these patients when they're at their high risk periods which we won't go into in this talk will need to be hydrated really well you're aiming for a urine output of about 80 to 100 mils per hour so blood tests you need, urea and electrolytes to check that renal function and the potassium, bone profile to check that phosphate and the corrected calcium, your serum urate, and optionally you can go for LDH or lactate dehydrogenase. This is a vague marker of cell turnover. So if the LDH is very high, that suggests that tumor lysis is more likely. Not essential though. So when do you need to be concerned? The parameters for laboratory TLS are at the top. So we've got urate at the very top, and if that goes over and is causing renal impairment, you can think about things like rasburicase. You have your potassium over 6 or 25% from baseline as well, and that standard treatment, salbutamol, insulin, that sort of thing. Phosphate, and that will usually be treated with um, fluids or dialysis if needed. And then calcium. With the calcium, you want to be concerned when someone's got any clinical features. If it's a little bit low, then you're not necessarily going to give them calcium straight away because what you don't want is to add into that calcium phosphate dynamic and actually make renal failure worse. So with this one, if it's low, it's simply something that needs to be escalated. Don't just go straight in with, um, with a syringe full of calcium chloride or whatever. The three lines at the bottom are the clinical features of TLS, so the serum creatinine being up, seizures, cardiac arrhythmias or death. I assume you'll be concerned by that point. Any of those that are occurring then again escalate straight away. That's about it, thank you very much for listening.